the next example will hopefully make that part a little bit more clear because what i'm saying is can i actually store that output and what i'm saying is this is an example where the output is actually being stored explicitly now let's look carefully at this code it's very similar to the previous one in the sense that i still have three function calls a b and c okay but what you'll notice is that the output of a goes into a variable called oa2 whereas the output of b or rather the input of b is another variable oa1 okay and what happens over here every time after all these three a b and c have computed i do an update i say oa1 equals oa2 in other words the next time around that i go into this function the next time i call this function right if i had a for loop over here and i kept calling top within this loop right then what i would do is the first time around that i call the function the oa1 would have this value the init value right and on subsequent calls it would get updated like this right obviously this oa1 has to be something i mean if i declare it as a global variable then this works correctly right in the sense that every time the function is called it updates some global variable and the next time the function is called this oa1 will be correctly present for b to use so uh, uh, the other way of looking at it is that it could also have been declared as some kind of a static variable right in c right both of them have essentially the same meaning it means that the value oa1 retains its state across successive calls to this function okay so now what does the data flow graph corresponding to this look like very similar to the previous one but slightly different okay this rectangle over here is essentially some kind of a storage or one iteration delay right and what i mean by that is by putting in that rectangle over there effectively i have taken this into account right what i'm producing as the output of a right is going to be oa2 whereas this is going to be oa1 and what is the relationship between oa1 and oa2 it gets updated at the end of every iteration on every clock tick in other words oa1 gets the most recent value from oa2 and copies it into its output making it ready for b to use on the next iteration through the system okay now by making this simple change what i have actually done is to say that if i was thinking in terms of how this can execute right timeline i can actually think now in terms of a over here which basically takes in input and produces oa1 and b which actually takes oa2 as input feeds into c and produces an output over here and this value from oa1 to oa2 comes across after the next iteration right if you look at this graph what you will notice is that the execution of a can now happen in parallel with b right because they are looking at the in other words whatever is produced by a right now is not going to be used by b okay and this is a crucial difference between the two uh, modes of the Uh, operation that i have discussed right okay can i take this further well before taking it further let's just do the analysis effectively what we have in other words is if i look at this diagram over here right the execution time of a is ta and this is going to be tb plus tc okay which means that the critical path i can't straight away say it is equal to tb plus tc it looks as though tb plus tc is more because of the way that i've drawn it but it actually depends on the numbers right a might be one very complicated function so in generally what is going to be is it's going to be the max between ta 
and TB plus TC. Okay. Can I take this further? Yes. All that I have to do is make sure that this OA2 that is produced by A is updated into the OA1 that is used by B. Similarly, OB2 that is produced by B is updated into the OB1 that is used by C. Okay. What does the data flow graph for this look like? There is a delay on each of these edges. In other words, what I have over here is produced by A is OA2, consumed by B is OA1, produced by B is OB2, consumed by C is OB1. Right? And in terms of the functional execution of the graph, what I can say is that A consumes in produces OA2, B consumes OA1 and produces OB2, C consumes OB1 and produces out. Right? And what is the relationship? I effectively have this, right? Whatever is produced by OA2 is used by OA1 the next time around and similarly this OB2 is used by OB1 the next time around. Okay. What implication does it have for the critical path? Now it is split up into three separate sections. TA, TB and TC are all separate units. Okay. So what have I done over here? Effectively what I have said is by putting these pipeline registers, right? This process, what I have done over here is called pipelining. And these registers are called pipeline registers, right? By putting in place those pipeline registers, I have provided some kind of storage, which basically allows me to say that after I have finished A, right, whatever it is that A produces is only going to be used by B the next time around. All that I need to do is go and put it into storage, which I have provided over here, right, the register, and wait until A, B, C, all of them have completed, so that I can then go into the next round of operation of all three of these, right. And as you can see, this is exactly what a pipeline looks like, right. I have three different operations over here, right. So basically what I will end up having is, I have three pieces of hardware, one corresponding to A, one corresponding to B, one corresponding to C. And what I'm effectively saying is that I can now have A0 over here, B0 perhaps running like this, and C0 taking a certain amount of time, right? And now I have finished all three of them, and I can then go forward and run A1. B1, C1, and so on. Right? So how does this help me? It basically means that now because the way that I have drawn it, B has the longest time period, B becomes the bottleneck, but A, B, and C, all of them are effectively executing in parallel. Why is this possible? Because each one of them is generating an output that is not used by the other units in the same iteration, right? I can finish the entire thing and then go back, update the values that I need to use for the next iteration and then make use of them, okay? So this pipelining, in other words, is a very simple way by which I can bring down the critical path. A critical path which had a value TA plus TB plus TC has now come down to max of ta comma tp comma tc what is the ideal situation over here ideally ta is equal to tb is equal to tc in which case the critical path has now come down to the original time period divided by three right? if it was not equally divided between all three of them then of course there would be some imbalance right but in the ideal situation where ta is equal to tb is equal to tc i will actually reduce the critical path by a factor of three now, this of course is something that is used widely, right? It's used in processors and various other kinds of 
systems as well. This is just a systematic way by which you can do it in the context of signal processing, right? And of course, I mean, if it was if this was all there was to it, it wouldn't be very useful. We will be looking at some generalizations as we move forward. So the idea of pipelining is we cut a forward path and insert a register. Okay? And this is sort of an important concept to keep in mind. We'll see why when we look at a more complicated example. One important assumption over here is that we are sort of assuming that the systems are time invariant. right? Now what do I mean by time invariant? Effectively what I'm saying is that if I have A, it produces some output which is used by B, right? Or if I had, or in other words, if I take this and I say that, you know, I'm going to delay this or store it. And so whatever is produced over here is some Bn. What will be at the output of this is going to be Bf n minus one at any given point in time, right? What I'm saying is that if I had this, right? What I would have over here would still be b n minus one, right? Why is that? Because now there is no delay on the output of b. But what it would mean is that this itself is going to be uh, it's going to have a n minus one as the input, and this is going to be a n, right? So if I have a n over here, some sample over here, right? So in other words, what I'm saying is the out, whether you get the output and you put it through some delay or you delay the input and then put it through the operating, you know, the functions, you basically are going to get the same output. Okay. Now you would probably think that, you know, this is obviously true. And in the case of signal processing systems, at least the ones that we are normally familiar with, yes, it is true. But this is not always absolutely true in all cases, right? There can be situations where the behavior of A and B itself depends on time in some way, right? In which case, whether you do the delay before you compute B or after you compute B will actually have an impact on the final output that is generated, okay? For the most part, this is not a big deal. It is not something that you need to worry about, but especially if you have sort of time variant systems, things that uh, you know, have uh, some kind of a counter and based on the value of the counter, they will behave differently. At that point, you need to sort of see, can I really do this kind of retime? Uh, can I do this kind of pipelining? Will it give me the correct output that I expect to see? Okay. And of course, what, the other thing that this brings up is this sort of distinction, which we also looked at in the previous uh, uh, class between something called the latency and the initiation interval, right? So to sort of explain that, what we have is, let's say that I have a system which looks like this. Right? And let's say that the original was something of this sort, right? What I'm saying is that in either case, the latency, so I'll call this one and this one two, Latency of 1 equals TA plus TB plus TC. Latency of 2 is actually going to be 3 times max of TA comma TB comma TC. Because effectively what I'll have is I'll have a clock period which is equal to max of TA, TB, TC. But if A, B and C are sort of equal distribution of time, then the latency is probably going to be the same. But the initiation interval of 1, this is very different. This is definitely going to be TA plus TB plus TC, right? Whereas for 2, it's going to be just max of TA, TB and TC, right? So the initiation interval basically says, when can I start the next iteration? And effectively what it's saying is, since, you know, each of these compute units, it produces an output that then gets stored you can then give it a new input and it can start computing the next set of values that it needs to proceed. Okay. So the initiation interval after pipelining at this level 
is can be significantly different than what it was before pipeline the latency can be different in general the latency actually gets a little bit worse right because max of ta tbtc uh, is not the same as mean of ta tbtc in general right so uh, three times max of ta tbtc is most probably going to be greater than ta plus tp plus tc so the latency may increase if you are lucky it may not but the initiation interval should definitely you know show a considerable improvement now, of course, this also assumes that A, B, and C are separate hardware units, right? There is separate hardware available for each function. And the only limiting factor was the dependency of the data use, right? So if we go back to the original uh, node, right? Over here, when I have something like this, this is a data dependency. Whereas, over here, when I put this storage or register, this breaks the dependency. Okay, and which effectively means that a given iteration of A and B can then run in parallel because I have got this storage element between them that can hold the value of A and update it for the next run of B. Okay. 